The victim in this case, Daphne Jean Bacon, was born in 1931. Growing up in a world marred by war, she was described as the most lovable girl by those that knew her. Her mother had passed when she was just 10 years old, and she was extremely close to her sisters and father, Harry Bacon. Her dad was a familiar face in the local community, working as a foreman painter in the town of Leiston, nestled a short distance inland along the Suffolk Heritage Coast. Shortly after the outbreak of World War II, children from the counties of Norfolk and Suffolk were evacuated for their own safety. Daphne and her sisters were no exception, and they often wrote home, greatly anticipating the day they could return to their picturesque town with family and friends surrounding them. Being away from home since September 1939, the day they were told they would be returning, the girls gleamed with excitement, as you would expect, and in the January of 1945, just before Hitler's death in April, the girls boarded a train homebound. Once the girls returned home from their evacuation in Bedford, Daphne and her twin sister Brenda settled down to life in Leyston once again. Daphne worked at the local food office as a clerk and often enjoyed rambling through the countryside. She was a helpful child, often going out of her way to help neighbours and was noted as being extremely friendly and polite. Although a very pretty girl looking more 16 years old than 14, she did not have a boyfriend. On the 8th of July 1945, a warm Sunday, the Bacon family attended church and walked home in time for some lunch. Just after they had finished their meal, Harry asked his girls what they were planning for the afternoon. The sun was out and the air was filled with the fragrance of early summer. Daphne and Brenda usually went on bike rides together towards the beach, just being a few short miles away. However, on this occasion... Daphne decided she wished to go for a walk. Not mentioning where she was heading, no one thought more about it. Now it's generally considered that it was safer in those times, and it's not unusual for children to return home after a long day of playing outside. I do know that even when I was a child living in the area, many years after this murder, it was considered the norm just to go out in the early morning explore the world alone or with friends, and return home just before dark. The path between Leyston and Aldringham, a small village just to the south, is a little more than a mile long. It is lined by farms and would have been a pleasant way to spend the afternoon walking. It was just along the same route she had taken the Wednesday previously, whilst on an errand. She had been delivering a message to a cottage not far from the army camp near Thorpe Ness. This may have been what prompted her to walk down to Aldringham Church that fateful afternoon. Although seeing many locals on her journey, it's not believed that she stopped to speak to anyone. Enjoying the afternoon sun in her summer dress, she was completely unaware that she was being stalked from the small wooded area just next to the path. She had not seen the eyes of the murderer that was following her as she walked past. Suddenly, a gruff voice startled Daphne as she wandered. She turned as she did not recognise it. She was being questioned on whether she had the right of way. Looking up at the uniformed man, she smiled and answered politely before carrying on her way, lost in her thoughts. She never heard the breathing of the frantic man closing in on her. She did not hear the footsteps of the senseless man as he approached her, brandishing a large stick. She did not see the anger in his eyes as he grew nearer. Out of the blue, she was hit on the back of the head. A dull thud rung out across the farmland. Still conscious, she turned before being hit again, and with the sudden jolt of adrenaline running through her veins, She tried to defend herself as blow after blow hit down across her face and head. Laying on the ground, struggling to comprehend what had just happened to her, and terrified, she closed her eyes. Her motionless, fragile body was then dragged through the field of rye to a nearby hedge that bordered a neighbouring pasture. The attacker tucked her bloodied body in tightly before leaving the scene, not looking back. 
It was just after 4pm when Miss Gee, who worked with Daphne's elder sister Monica at the Layston Post Office, was taking a walk with her boyfriend, Mr Mears, who also worked for the Postal Service in the nearby town of Saxmundham. They settled down beside a field near Aldringham Church to eat a picnic and were enjoying each other's company when they started to hear some faint moans. The couple, concerned that someone had fallen and hurt themselves, decided to follow the whimpering along the trail, only to find trampled down crops splattered with blood. Progressing carefully, the couple heard the groans grow louder until they stumbled upon Daphne's beaten and bloodied body. She was barely conscious and speaking incoherently. Mr Mears later testified, whilst in court, how he found the young girl. The image had become seared into his mind and described how her face and hands were smothered in blood, her hair was saturated and the tip of her middle finger on her left hand was almost severed. She had fought bravely, trying to defend herself at all costs. He spoke to her as she was hanging on to consciousness telling her to wait just a little while longer as help was coming and that she was going to be fine, that she was found and he was not going to leave her. He instructed Miss Gee to call police, who promptly ran to find a telephone box. Before arriving, the police called for Dr Burlingham from Layston to the scene so he could tend first aid. Shortly after being discovered, Daphne was moved to the nearby Layston Primary School as the doctor believed she was in a near-death state and ran for an ambulance to attend. The victim's father was called by police and rushed to the school. Heartbreakingly, watched over by many feeling helpless, he held his precious daughter and soothed her in the only way a parent can, through tears. Just before entering the ambulance, Daphne's last words to her father were, a British soldier hit me with a stick. The ambulance arrived at Ipswich General Hospital at 5.30pm. Daphne lost her fight for life at 9 that evening, her death caused by shock from multiple head injuries. The post-mortem was held at 12.15am on the 9th of July by Dr Eric Biddle, Chief Pathologist at Ipswich General Hospital, and Dr Keith Simpson, who famously went on to conduct post-mortems in the cases of the acid bath murders in 1949, and George Cornell, who was shot by Ronnie Cray in 1966. It was concluded that the young girl had died of shock, and it was noted that she had significant protective-type injuries, including the almost severed finger, from her attempts at trying to defend herself. There were reports of black seeds embedded in multiple cuts and that she had suffered from seven separate blows to the skull. Dr Simpson had previous to the post-mortem attended the scene of the crime and it was concluded that Daphne was dragged across the field by her ankles. Now initially, when the news reached the townspeople, widespread panic ensued. This was a safe place. Things like this did not happen in the sleepy Suffolk countryside. Attacks like this only happened in cities. Mothers that would not have thought about keeping their children indoors over the summer forbid their young to go play on the common lands or to travel to the beach alone. The investigations began immediately and Detective Inspector Reed of Suffolk Police headed the inquiry into the case. At once, officers were stationed at the field, waiting to see if the perpetrator would return and to keep the crime scene secure. Knowing that foul play was at hand, Reed wasted no time in calling the Detective Chief Inspector Ted Greeno from Scotland Yard's Flying Squad, who took charge of the case. His initial move was to make a public appeal, and his team of detectives began interviewing possible witnesses who had seen the victim walking along her route. Detective Reed made a statement to the nation's press stating that he believed the sadist was still in the district. The story of a young girl murdered by what was believed to be a serviceman shook the country and it quickly became a high-profile case being reported nationwide. Daily updates and appeals were published as far as Scotland and Ireland. There were many lines of inquiries during the 15-day long investigation. Over 100 police officers assisted following every single clue. 
Stories of a soldier wearing a black beret loitering around Aldringham had been rumoured for weeks before Daphne's cold-blooded murder. It was said that he would harass the young women of the village, usually trying to talk to them or ask them on dates. However, no one had expected such a dark end to the tale. The police began the search into the rye field belonging to Elm Tree Farm for the murder weapon, believed to be a blunt instrument. Calling upon the farmer Thomas Skew to cut the rye so a detailed search could take place. The crop was ripe, leaving a bitter and dusty scent in the air. They did this to all neighbouring pastures, including those across the Thorpe Ness Road. Upon the discovery of a bloodstained surface cap and footprints, Detective Greeno had one more piece of the puzzle, and it became clear that it was highly likely that a soldier was involved. At the time, Suffolk hosted many army bases, housing British, American and Italian armed services. Many of those serving nearby, such as in Thorpe Ness, less than two miles away, were in the area for the removal of beach mines. The troops were confined to their barracks and began to help the investigation. At the request of Detective Reed and Greeno, military vehicles brought soldiers to Laysan Police Station. Some of these men were questioned three times, with no real leads emerging. Early reports issued in the press recount how they wished to speak to two 20-year-old women that were reading a magazine wearing bathing suits and skirts as spoken to soldiers. This was pretty early in the day, just before noon, outside the pub on the village's main road. Police felt it was of significant importance, however that particular line of investigation soon ran dry. There was a theory that due to the fact that Daphne had taken the exact route on the Wednesday, that she may have met a soldier from one of the local army bases and agreed to a meeting on the Sunday. This seemed possible, however, it was soon ruled out. Another line of inquiry led police to believe that there may have been a car involved in the crime. A woman living close to Thorpe Ness had told police that she had seen a girl in a dress that looked remarkably like the description of Daphne and her outfit that day walk past her window at about 3.30pm. If this was in fact Daphne, it left no time for her to walk back to the fields by the church in Aldringham, as it was almost two miles away, and it was in fact soon discovered that it was just a case of mistaken identity. A couple on a walk near the railway line, close to the rye field, reported to police that later in the evening of July 8th, they were approached by an agitated soldier. However, at the time they did not know of Daphne's attack, and believed he may have just been late getting back to the camp. With very few breakthroughs, and almost two weeks passed, Daphne's funeral was held on the 20th of July, and the tight-knit communities of the rural Suffolk area banded together in attendance, as Daphne was laid to rest in her hometown. The grief was profoundly felt by all as they watched the suffering family try to come to terms with their loss. She had returned home just six months before, and then brutally taken away without a care, and people were angry that no one had yet been held accountable. That was until there was a search of personal property at one of the barracks that led police to a disturbing trophy taken from the crime. Finally, on the 23rd of July, an arrest was made. During his second interview with Detective Greeno, the gunner, Ernest George Bailey, became anxious whilst being pressed for his exact movements on the 8th of July. Ernest Bailey was struggling to remember what he'd said just the previous day when he'd visited the police station. He was not yet aware that they had discovered the ear of rye saturated in the blood of his victim, and he claimed innocence and in saying he could not remember. But as Greeno and his assistant Detective Sergeant Hodges firmly asserted he was lying, and they had proof, he cracked and made a confession. Ernest Bailey began by describing how he had joined the army at 11, as a bandboy. He then continued with a clear and chilling declaration of guilt. I am 38 years old, single, and living with my mum and sister in Plymouth. On Sunday the 8th of July, I left my camp to take a walk. I wandered past the church and into a small wood. From there, I spied a young lady walking carefree along the path towards the church. I began to follow the girl. I had this sudden sexual urge come over me. 
I quickened my pace so I could catch up with her. I asked her what she was doing on this ground, and she replied, I'm allowed to walk through here. I inquired who gave her permission to do so. She chose to ignore me. I then asked her, are you a single girl? And she answered yes, and continued walking. It was obvious she did not want to speak to me, so I continued to follow her along the path. It was then I picked up a stick from the hedgerow. It was a couple of feet long and quite thick, like a small branch from a tree. This sudden urge came upon me and I struck her on the back of the head with the stick. She turned to fight me off and I struck again and again, many times as she cowered before me, covering her head with her hands. I continued striking her when she fell to the ground. Realising what had taken place, I became frightened and ran off. But I returned to collect the stick. I then dragged her through the rye field to the hedge where I left her. Though her dress had ridden up, I did not touch her. Hearing approaching voices, I hid in the rye a few yards away. I heard the man say, go get help, call the police and the doctor. It was 4pm when I first hit the girl as I heard the church bell strike. I then heard other people talking. I hid in the field for about an hour before I dare return to the spot. While I was under cover, I removed my shirt looking for blood splatter. I put my shirt back on and when I got to the spot where I'd left the girl, she was no longer there so I continued back along the path towards my camp. I still had hold of the stick so I lobbed it as far as I could into the woods as I passed by. When I got back to my hut at the camp, I stripped naked. I found no sign of the young lady's blood on me or my uniform but I did have to clean my shoes as they were caked with mud. Around 7pm I went for my supper and I did not speak to anyone. I just went back to my hut and I laid on my bed. As I could not find rest or sleep, I lit up my pipe. When questioned why I was just laying there by one of my mates, I replied that I had a lot to think about. I lay awake all night thinking about what I had done to that poor girl. I did not sleep and I have not slept since. I'm sorry I hit the girl. At 12.40am, he was charged with the murder of Daphne Jean Bacon, 14 years old. His first court appearance took place on the 28th of July to an overflowing courtroom in Halesworth Magistrate Court where Bailey pleaded not guilty and was remanded to Norwich Prison until August 2nd at which time he would appear at Saxmundham Magistrates Court. There again his plea was noted the same and he was remanded to appear at Halesworth Magistrates on August 14th to face charge of murder. At Halesworth Magistrates Ernest Bailey appeared before the Earl of Cranbrook who, upon hearing arguments by the Chief Prosecuting Officer, ordered the case to be heard at Bury St Edmunds Assize Court on October 31st. At Bailey's trial in Bury St Edmunds, he stood in the dock before the judge, Mr Justice Laws. Bailey yet again entered a plea of not guilty through his defending solicitor. The courtroom was bustling every single day, And it began with the prosecution declaring that the victim was an innocent girl having not had any boyfriends or association with soldiers, although there were a great many living locally. Continuing throughout the trial, he illustrated the contradictions in Bailey's statements and evidence that showed what a dubious character he was. Turning to the jury, the prosecuting solicitor told the court... In the right-hand pocket of his trousers, the police forensic officer found a blood-stained ear of rye, which matched the blood group of Daphne. Members of the jury, if you believe this evidence, coupled with the various stories by Bailey, you'll be driven to the conclusion that he was responsible for this murder. The prosecution called upon many witnesses, including Harry Bacon, Daphne's father, who stated how much his daughter loved to go for walks in the countryside. A farm labourer named Frederick Ashton told of his horror when he saw Daphne. She was a dreadful sight. John Mears, the young man who discovered the girl, recalled the horrific scene once again for the jury. Finally called into the witness box stood the newly promoted Detective Superintendent Ted Greenough. He began his evidence. However, the defence called into question the confession, claiming it was inadmissible. Mr Justice Laws, which, by the way, is a brilliant name for a judge, then retired to the jury until the next day. The case was continued on November 1st, and the judge ruled that Greeno's evidence was valid, and he ruled out that there was any improper interrogation whilst Bailey was in police custody. 
The hearing resumed with the defence calling upon an expert witness named Dr John Vincent Morris, who was at the time the medical superintendent to the Norfolk County Council Mental Colony. He told the court that through his recent observations and the previous history of Bailey, he had come to the conclusion that he was a feeble-minded person who was suffering from congenital mental defect with a mental age of around about a nine and a half year old. Before joining the army, he had been described as mentally deficient, adding, I feel that Mr Bailey knew what he was doing at the time was wrong because he told me that he expected to get three months for murder. The judge responded, are you asking the jury to say that you have proved to them that this man is indeed insane? Dr Morris replied, no, my lord. And the defence counsel intervened with, Dr Morris was asking the jury if he had satisfied them that at the time he committed the attack, something had come over him. He could not control himself and did not know what he was doing. The judge began his summing up of the case by explaining to the jury that to agree a guilty of verdict by insanity, the defence counsel must satisfy them that Bailey was indeed insane when he committed the murder. Bailey, who remained detached and unemotional, was led down to the cells in silence. The sentence was scheduled to take place on Tuesday, November 27th, 1945. But within a day or so of the sentencing taking place, the then Home Secretary commuted his sentence to life imprisonment after considering his mental health and the testimony that was put forward during the trial. Ernest George Bailey was imprisoned and there is a local rumour that states he only served about 15 years. I cannot find evidence to support this, however there isn't much known about his time after conviction. So, what do you think of this case? Is it one that you've heard before? Now, each week I do want to make a recommendation of something I've listened to or watched or read. And for this week's recommendation, I'm going to choose one of my personal favourites. The True Crime Enthusiast. Paul the host is wonderfully talented and his passion is really reflected throughout his research and his sympathetic approach to telling the victim stories. His mantra of no one deserves to be forgotten is something I really, truly do appreciate. The podcast covers lesser known cases and with all the hard work that evidently goes into the show, I always look forward to seeing a new episode hit up my podcast feed. Paul is a lovely guy, always friendly and up for a chat. So why don't you go over to the True Crime Enthusiast podcast feed and get engrossed in the new true crime story. Don't forget to subscribe and share. So after all the horrors that have graced our ears in this episode, I would hope that you guys would like to put some goodness back in the world. I wish to propose something for my listeners, just to make a small random act of kindness this week, just to try and balance those scales out. We do need a kinder world and that's everyone's responsibility to do. So if you can this week, Go visit someone elderly or give them a call. I don't care who it is. It could be your neighbour, a friend or a family member. I really don't mind. Just go have a cuppa, talk about long times past. And, you know, if they need help, even if it's just going to the shop for some milk, do it. Loneliness is a killer. And, well, hey, you may learn something new. So go be good people. Go be kind. Go be safe and most importantly, go be happy. Thank you for listening and toodle pip cheerio.